Good afternoon and welcome to Neighbor Power's first Neighborhood Forum. I'm Alicia Collins and I'm with the Central Indiana Community Foundation. I will be your moderator for our time together. Um, I would just like to first thank INRC for this first ever Neighborhood Forum, so give them a hand. I'm a proud product, I'm going to give a little commercial, I'm a proud product of INRC. Um, I took advantage of all of their trainings, workshops, mentorships back in the early 90s. <laughs> and then I was also a former staff member in the early 2000s and it has really changed my career and has been a, a true um, development opportunity for me. And so this is another opportunity for residents to develop their skill set in the public hearing setting. So this opportunity and the purpose for this is to have our residents speak to people who are either decision makers, policy makers, just to listen. Our two topics are pre-K education and the need to activate youth for positive change. This is an opportunity again just for our panelists up here just to listen, but they can ask clarifying questions. Let me go over the process and the ground rules. We've had a selection table out there for speakers to sign up. Right now we only have three. We would like some more, so there will be, right now we have one person for youth and two people for education. Each one of those individuals would get five minutes to express their opinion, ideas, or solution on that topic. And then the panelists will at, be able to ask clarifying questions. We have a buzzer down here that will manage our time so you don't have to worry about it. And that's it. At this time, I will ask for each one of our guests up here to introduce themselves. You have one minute. <laughs> Why did she start with you? This, this will be easy. I'm Rick Height, Chief of Police, and I work for you. And I'm David Wants. I'm the Director of Public Safety, and I work with him and for you. <laughs> My name is Deborah Law. I'm the Deputy Prosecutor of Neighborhoods for the Marion County Prosecutor's Office, and I work in the Community Prosecution Division. I am Susan Smith, and I am a candidate for Council of District 12, which is on the east side near Community Hospital East, and I would love to be able to work with and for you. <laughs> My name is Chuck Madden, and I'm a city council uh, candidate for District 9, and I too want to advocate for you and my neighborhood. And I'm Sally Spires. I am also a candidate for City County Council in District 17, which is basically the northeast corner of Center Township. I'm Kelly Bentley. I'm not a candidate for City County Council. Um, I serve on the IPS school board representing District 3, and um, I'm a lifelong resident of Indianapolis and continue to enjoy serving you. Uh, I'm Jeff Miller, currently on the City Council of District 19, which is the near southeast, south, and southwest sides of town. They renumber all the districts, so it'll be 16 if I'm blessed with being reelected in November. Uh, and I came to and presented at the first Neighbor Power uh, several years back. Love this, love this attendance that we've seen. This is fantastic. I do indeed uh, receive election from you and more importantly then turn around and work for you. That is the whole reason I've done this. I hate politics, but I love being a public servant. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Bob Osley. I'm a, currently a city county councilor in District 15, uh, which is uh, Washington Street to 30th Street. 
um, basically Alabama on the west, I mean on the east side, and Tibbs on the west. And I've had an amazing opportunity to work in our, in our communities, uh, trying to reestablish opportunities for jobs, for those who are skilled, those who are unskilled, and most especially those individuals who've made bad choices in their lives um, and want a second chance. And I do believe that that is something that, that, that we all would support, um, opportunities and opportunities for those who, who, who seek a better life. So I think that's what we all basically are up here for, just trying to make sure that our communities are strong and our households are, are, are fit and safe. So thank you. So we will start with the importance of pre-K. And I just wanted to remind our speakers, if you could, when you come to the mic, which is in the center right here, if you could share your name and your neighborhood. Ms. Kelly Jones. Hi, my name is Kelly Jones, and I'm the owner of Leverage House Care and Health Care Academy for Quality Solutions. Um, we are in the neighborhood of Aaron and Emerson um, on the south east side where Suwana Martinez. Oh, Suwana Martinez. <laughs> Um, we're a house quality locally in home child care. We've been around since 2009. We are now a department of education approved on our way to program. I have a vested interest in this community. My family has been in this community for 150 years. Um, and the importance of pre-K really envelops many things. Um, I, first off, it will make your job easier. Um, it is extremely important in the zero five level of education to uh, instill the social values uh, that we need to have a little older. And once we hit five, it's the position of sale, you now have to fix the problem instead of developing it properly. Um, in our um, work, one of the things that I've noticed uh, is that we severely desperately need early education career professionals. And I say that out because we have a lot of people coming through looking for a job. If you want a job, you go for private address. If you want a career, you come and you're talented enough, which believe it or not, it pushes you like an American Idol for early education because this is a study that everybody can You have to know how to do it. Um, and you have to understand early education, brain development, social development, and disabilities, all of that, and that takes education. You cannot do it without it. Um, our profession has a 35% turnover rate. And if you think about your children, and you think, oh, I'm going to pay my with this lady who I really like when I first signed up for this child care, but a week later as a different lady, and two weeks after that as a different person, there is no continuity of care. And we are long past a time in our life when mommy is the one that's raising us. I was raised by mom. Um, we are now in a place where we have to hand our baby over to someone so that we can go to work and have peace of mind while we're there. Um, we lose excellent educators to jobs that make us five or ten thousand more a year. I've lost. Uh, substitute teachers to uh, all these because if they still came out, that's really sad. <laughs> and they're talented. Um, the majority of our teachers are on some sort of public assistance. They're not totally dependent, and they're caught in the best between making a dollar too much to get help and falling off without being able to cover their expenses. My accountant tells me I have a hobby in my business. That's mm -hmm. very hurtful. <laughs> Because I have a passion and I absolutely give every ounce of myself, my home, my two children's sacrifice for early education and to, for it to be a hobby, not something that supports me fully. I have to look outside my profession to find other ways to support my family. That's unacceptable. Centers um, and ministries on the same level of quality as I am. Yet they take 25% more by state programs than I do. Um, and they tell me that the way to get the same as them is to tell my parents that I charge the same as them. Which makes no sense because we charge less because we're serving the working poor. 
and that's families that make too much for those state programs, but not enough to pay the high cost for a center style care. We have um, passion. Um, I, I doubt highly that you're gonna find people that have more passion that we, than we do, and I know lots of early educators that are like, die hard, ride or die, won't give up no matter what, and even if you give them a dollar an hour, they'll still do it. Um, performance through profession. We need to develop our interested youth, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of going over here a little bit, um, into early education career professionals. So I have a little joke, but my joke is, hey, who really wants to be an early educator when they grow up? Destined to a life of living pillar to post, unable to make rent, all while being expected to never miss a day of work, even when you're deathly ill. The reason I came up with child care staffing for quality solutions is because I wanted to go to the hospital for three days and birth my child. And I couldn't close my child care to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. From our panelists, are there any questions that you have that that we, you would like clarified? Kelly, please come back up here. There's the mic. Is it possible uh, for you to use um, interns from the local colleges that are in early childhood development um, to participate in your program? That is totally possible. Um, however, they're also looking for paying jobs too, so it's very hard to depend on them 100%. So when, when you want your child to go into their pre-K program or, or you know, you younger, you need people that are going to be around for the whole school year, the whole time. Interns are awesome for the tidbits, for the little closing of the gaps, but we need people that are here for it, they're in it to win it kind of people. And there's long-term costs for that? Sorry. <laughs> go, so no, go, girl. Anyone that is working with the children has to have CPR, first aid, drug tested, background check, fingerprint, and fingerprint is $40 a pop for each of them to pay for or the center to pay for. And when you have staff turnover of 35 percent, $40 a pop adds up. It costs us $250 to hire each of our substitute teachers. We pay for that cost up front, and then we try to get that back from them as long as they work per pay period at $25. So we're trying to cut that. Right. Is it possible that you work with the university so that a specific uh, program is developed in their curriculum so that um, the intern is a year. So I'm asking, have you worked with any of the universities that can specifically come to that? I've, I've also tried to develop that um, with one of our particular institutions, and it's just never quite clicked. It kind of needs to be a partnership between, I think, a couple of organizations to say, uh, to make that a full year. I also think that um, what I'm trying to do as a company for childcare staffing is to give our um, people that are interested in early education, or at least have a talent for it, to develop them that way, because if you think about nurses and doctors, you don't just throw a doctor into a exam room and say, hey, you're a doctor. <laughs> That's what we're doing with early education. And aside from those few background checks and drug tests and things like that, that's unacceptable. Here, here's my most precious child. It's six weeks old, it can't talk, and all it does is cry because it's got colic. Okay, but I'm only gonna pay you 7.25 or eight an hour. <laughs> and I need you to be educated. That does, that none of that adds up. Are there other clarifying questions? Okay, 
One yes. quick question. The, uh, the council's pre-K program, but I believe also the state's program, is tied to the United Way's Pass to Quality, which is trying to obviously improve the quality we're expecting from our pre-K providers. I'm wondering, do you think that can help create more demand? Not that you're not, you are clearly a qualified pre-K provider, let me stress. But do you think by creating more demand for folks that are higher up on that scale of qualifications, might turn around and increase the salary demands around that. I'm trying to think in my head how we can do that because you're right. You, no one's going to want to go in the field if they can't live off of it. Right. But if we keep pressing for higher quality, which does require a lot of the things you've said, maybe that helps. I'd be interested I, in your I, thought on that. Yes, I agree. And when one of the disparities that I find interesting is that I, I physically can't get from the state the same amount that a center would get for the same level of quality that I provide. So that right there is kind of like, what you want, guys? <laughs> I'm doing it. I've got my education. Um, my teachers have their education. I'm constantly looking for other ways to get that education going. My Even my substitutes don't actually qualify for the, the big scholarship that's out there is the teach scholarship. Um, and there's like a tiny stipulation that just kind of puts us out of the running for that. But I, if, I, if I could say, hey, you're straight scholarship, you work with us, boom, you're gonna have your early education degree. And the beauty of working with us is that you get to go here, 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 and here, and you get all that experience to take to your permanent position. So that's what we really wanna do, and that's what's best for the children, honestly. Great, thank you, Kelly. See how easy that was? <laughs> Okay, we're gonna move to activating youth. I'm sorry. Oh, come for it. Sorry. Go ahead. We have a question from uh, Councilor Otsley. You would ask about the, or you had mentioned the 35% turnover. And um, I wanted to know if that was industry wide and what you believe that, uh, or what you learned. They were leaving to go to what? Were they leaving the profession entirely? The average salary of a child care teacher in Indiana is nineteen thousand dollars. It's a stack too. My office does a study each year for study. For, I'm Beth Riedemann. I represent community heights. I also am a professional development advisor for child care um, employees. I oversee a non-formal training program for teachers who maybe didn't succeed very well in high school and but now need a CDA, which is the minimum requirement for a teacher. Um, and which is that too, it's a credential, it's four classes at Ivy Tech, that's all you need to be a teacher in an early child care program. Um, and the average salary is $19,000. I got into this field because I started working with middle schoolers and I was like, we gotta get them sooner. And then I was like, I started working with elementary kids. Oh my God, we gotta get them sooner. And then I had my own child and I, so I ended up in ECE partially too because I couldn't afford child care working in the field, working in a nonprofit and having a child. Um, and so I was an assistant director of a for-profit large chain of child cares and was on food stamps and child care vouchers. Um, and I was the second person in charge. Um, and so I have a deep passion for it because I know what my child's teachers now go through. He's two. I've been in their shoes. I speak to these students that are in my classes that are the teachers and I say, I understand. I've been on food stamps. I'm a single mom. I've been on WIC. I get it. Um, but it's a reality, the turnover is huge. Um, the QRI system, which is not the United Way, the state runs it. Um, sorry, I had the clarification. But, um, and we, level three and level four is what we consider high quality. Um, that's what the state has considered high quality. Um, that's what On My Way Pre-K Pre funds. If you're not familiar with On My Way Pre-K, it's five counties, there's a pilot, and then Indianapolis added on to it with extra slots. Um, and that is an amazing program. Um, what we need to be careful of is pushing people through to level three and four just so we have more slots. Um, because I've, I've seen product of that in person when I go to visit to find out when I moved to the east side, I needed to find a quality childcare. I started with level threes and fours and I said, how are you a level three and a level four? Um, and then to piggyback on some of the things she said too, uh, 
the education is only possible, it's only required to have a CDA, first of all. That's just a credential, and you can only afford to do those classes if you're a full-time employee, 30 hours or more. Um, if you work for at one single place. Um, and so, for example, if you work for a YMCA, you work at 29.5 hours because they don't want to be able to have to provide you insurance, so they work you 30 hours a week. So a lot of teachers are automatically not able to further their education. Um, and so I just, I wanted to speak last just because I have some of the data and stuff and any questions I guess you may have for me, but I just think it's, when I moved to the Near East Side, I, um, I'm actually outside on the east side. There is deserts of qual high quality child care. There are not very many high quality child cares on the east side. Um, we have Daystar and we have East 10th, but I have to drive to go to those. They're not in my neighborhood. Um, there is a black hole somewhat um, in our area of level threes and fours where I live, and that I think happens throughout the city. And I think um, Early Learning Indiana saw that. That's why they reopened um, Eastern Stars Center, but it's only for three-year-olds and up. So, um, there's definitely gaps in our care, and there's definitely, it's sad when you're, you know, your child care teachers is probably, a lot of the women's, it's mostly women, it's not all women, but the most on stay in the field, because A, they do love the babies, but B, they can't afford to go anywhere else, because they couldn't afford child care any, if they went anywhere else, because they're getting discounted child care the majority of the time at where they work. Any additional questions from our panel? Okay, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next topic, activating youth for positive change. And we have Mr. Sobeko Jawanza. And let's just say my name is Sebeko Jawanza. Thank you for everybody on the panel. Thank you for everybody who came in here uh, for these dis discussion topics. I'm representing the neighborhood of Hallville. I'm also part of a mentor program that goes directly into the juvenile center and has those that are on probation come to our classes. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of work over the past couple of years with trying to get youth engaged in terms of critical thinking, understanding where they're at, what they're doing, how that affects them. Um, I have a question. One, about the term at risk and how we use that term in terms of, uh, you know, it kind of seems like it's a uh, income level type thing, um, also based on certain habits that they have. And so when we use that term saying that these kids are at risk, what are we really giving them in terms of a message when we really should probably be saying that we are at risk if we don't do anything to help them. Uh, the mentor program that I'm in um, deals with a lot of young people who've stolen cars, been in the wrong place at the wrong time. A lot of it has to do with their engagement level when it comes to school. If they're not really engaged when it comes to school, then they will be out in the streets doing a lot of things that they really shouldn't have any business doing, but they see that it's giving them a resource, whether it's money, whether it's camaraderie, um, whether it's just a story to tell the next day. And so how can we, and I mean, we have different sectors here, but how can we kind of, uh, I guess, engage the schools as well as community centers to have a synergy of energy <laughs> that goes towards these young people to where we can have things that they can do before school, after school, during summertime. Um, things that we can work together, not just different organizations doing different things and they can only serve five or ten people, but actually having something to where all the schools, township, IPS, anything like that, as well as community businesses can come together and kind of give these young people opportunities to at least learn different things that they can do and the way that it works out uh, in their lives. Because if they see their parents who went to college or went to school and are struggling right now to get them the things that they want, it's not going to be very attractive to them. When you're a young person, nothing in adulthood except for doing what you want to do is attractive. You know, so it's, it's kind of a catch-22 in terms of that end. But when I engage these young people in my classes, very intelligent, but could care less about school. Can get the concept, but could care less about letting you know that they get it. 
or are showing it on a test, and so then they fail or get kicked out of school. And I think a lot of people are getting suspended and kicked out for other, <laughs> which means anything that can really go from, um, you know, not having your pencil to causing a disruption. disruption. Uh, also want to understand how schools can better utilize um, mentors and people like that instead of suspending students and having them out on the streets or at home when their parents are at work where they can have a program in school, especially dealing with um, trades. So we always push college, but we don't push trade schools, how they can go get a trade and work and make money right out of high school and then go to college and then do things like that. We don't really push anything that's like that. And so it's just, you know, a couple of years, I'm a young man, 30, you know, I've been trying to kind of figure some things out. The neighborhoods that I grew up in, I'm familiar with everything that goes on. Uh, I just chose to do different things. Even when I saw them and how beneficial it was, I always knew the path that I wanted to take, but a lot of people aren't as strong to do a separate path than what's around them. And so what kind of encouragement together can we do instead of like individual entities that's coming together and trying to do things? We don't serve the large majority of the city like that. And so I wanna know about more collaborative efforts that might help out, or if there isn't any, how can we start getting that together? So let me remind the panel that they are not to respond to the question that he's posing, but to ask clarifying questions to gain more information and understanding of his opinion. I still have to mildly break the rule and compliment you on redefining at risk. That was very good. Anybody who's 14 or 15 years old is at risk. Because if they're not in school, it doesn't matter what neighborhood they're in, it doesn't matter what their background, what their family, they're at risk. That was brilliant. Um, it's interesting, two, three years ago even, I wouldn't have thought the council would have any role in pre-K, which is the original thing we just talked about. I didn't have a clue what we would do. Smarter people than me, Office of Education and Innovation, Lilly, United Way, sat down and said, here's what you can do. And we all partnered together and we've done an amazing thing in the city. I would love to hear feedback from you, from anyone, on what ideas you have as well. Because you raise a good point. We're not cool. I'm, well, this guy's cool. I am not cool. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to come up with something to entertain those kids. But I want to be part of the solution. So yeah, if you have thoughts on how the council can raise the bar, whether it's through funding, whether it's through using our position to promote ideas, please, ev everyone, but you, you especially have this passion, that would really help because, like I say, three years ago there was no pre-K, and now look what we've got. We can do this. We can hit the ages at both ends. So please just share any thoughts you ever have today or in the future. Um, one thing is that uh, we have a large case of uh, young people who are labeled as ADHD. And so when they're sitting down in the classroom for hours on hours on end, it doesn't matter whether they care about the content or not, they just can't sit still like that. Um, I remember summers that my mom would put me into certain camps. I was a very good student, so I'd always qualify to go into these certain camps. Engineering camps where we'd build remote control cars and things like that. Um, we need to start utilizing some of those things with people who are sometimes, you know, maybe failing school or getting kicked out of school. And, not using the programs for people who are making straight A's and things like that. You know, keep it with them as well, but also thinking like, hey, this person might need a different engagement in terms of understanding that. Uh, also, we need to start thinking about ways to get people, young people involved in um, environmental things. So uh, when we talk about reusable energy, when we're talking about farming and things like that, you know, I had 4-H club when I was younger, you know, how can we get some of this urban um, agriculture industry that's moving towards our city engaged into middle schoolers and even elementary schoolers and have them feel that that's an important thing. So in high school, they can connect some of the things that they are learning or any of the things that they are teaching themselves outside of school into some things that will produce something that will be a kind of a massive city movement type of thing, uh, especially when it comes to renewable energy, water, and solar energy. Um, I think that right there, getting them as young as possible and get the ones who are in trouble. Get those who can't sit still, you know, and have them out and doing things and keeping them moving and keeping them engaged. 
you know, we have one person with 30 students in a class, you can't engage everybody. So we have to have outside programs that not only assist, but in some forms we think of school as a foundation. Home is the foundation and then the community, and then it's the school. So if they don't have that foundation at home and in the community, the schools aren't going to do very much with them. And so when we're talking about advocating and trying to push youth into these, these things, then we need to see what the home is looking like, if it's a structure that um, is adequate for them to create change. And if it's not, we have to create that. Because uh, they're not going to be able to do it on their own. They're just going to survive the way they've been surviving, and they'll take any type of risk that it takes. You know, so you got young people 12, 13 years old that have about two, three thousand dollars in their pocket. You can't tell them anything. They have more money in their pocket than their parents. So until we can show them, you know, certain things, hey, you want a remote control car? I'll show you how to build it. You know, something like that. Then there can you can start talking to them about different industries. Like you know, they make this amount. You can do things, and we might even get the next person to innovate some of those changes within these young people if we encourage them. Quit going to you know straight A students and like that, and offering them programs. Offer it for everybody. You know, and, and then we get the label. You know that labeling out of that. You know you put people who might have you know been kicked out of the school with somebody who's making straight A's and put them in the classroom together, put them in a, in a center together, and they're doing working on the same project. You know, I mean that gives the person confidence as well as understanding that that one person who might be excelling in school might have a different opinion about people who aren't, and they might be able to help them out a little bit. So encouraging that unity right there to where peer counseling can can have an effect. Because, hey, we, I'm getting to the point where they're looking at me like that, too, where I'm not cool. But, you know, their peers, they understand themselves, you know what I'm saying? So that peer counseling can also help a lot and take a lot of weight off our struggles, you know? <laughs> She's awesome. <laughs> and if you're not cool, then we're we're in big problem. And I, I, that was my clarifying question. I've known your mother for years and years and years, and she's an incredible person, and she's got to be super proud of you. So I appreciate that. Not just that. I mean, with that point right there, you know, my mom and my father have been very much involved in the community. So that's why I have this passion. But it wasn't just those two. If it was just up to them in terms of where I got, what I got, I would have been on another path. It was a group of people, including them, that I respected and that I looked up to. So, you know, we have to kind of keep that in mind that just because somebody has two parents in the household, that means nothing. You know, you have to have that community base. Do you think uh, changing the way that we educate uh, children and making it not so generic that it incorporates uh, maybe what they're good at with mathematics or what they're good at with reading and English so that they can keep interested in, in that, in, right, in that uh, those required courses? So I'm, I'm a college graduate. I went to Florida a and University for business administration. Ever since I was in preschool up until my college years, there's always been kind of a basic of sitting in the classroom, teacher up front, they give you a syllabus. So they're telling you what they're going to teach you throughout the, the year. We don't engage the students in terms of understanding what they know about the subject first and what they would like to learn and incorporate in the syllabus to what their needs are in the, in the classroom so that they are engaged a little bit more. If you're talking about history, and you're talking about the American Revolutionary War and things like that, and you just kind of throw out a name and say, okay, do a report about them, that's fine. But if you kind of find out the interest of the students a little bit more, and then assign certain reports based off of their interests, I think you'll see more of an engagement. And then you get to see kind of the connection so they understand how their interest matches up with someone else's interest. It also needs to definitely be a like very clear like from PE and science experiments and things like that, more hands-on has to happen. Um, we have a lot of people who are probably getting suspended because they're just bored. And it's not that they can't do the work, but they're not engaged enough. And one teacher with 30 students, one teacher with 50 students, you know, it's not going to work out like that. You know, they're trying to do as simple as a job. So you're right, it's generic. And we expect everybody to excel with generic work. But, you know, think about LeBron James. He didn't just go to any other basketball camps, you know, he kind of went to the best ones and they saw his talent. But if a mediocre player were to go to the same camps, that will increase their talents and make them better and make them better. And so we kind of have to think about 
on an individual basis. I know it's thousands and thousands of students, but if we're trying to make a difference, generic's not gonna work. It has to be individualized. How do we um, communicate to young people um, that it's not good to have children as teenagers because that has been perpetuating the problem, especially in the African-American community. Um, how would you, or and do you, in your mentoring program, do you talk to the young men about, um, you know, fatherlessness and it's perpetuated by this continuous having sex outside of marriage? So in my mentor program, uh, we have a curriculum kind of set. I don't really follow it to exactly the T, but if I had to check something off, it would be checked off. And then one of those is a, an income balance sheet. And we give out what, how much rent, electricity, pretty much to do bills. And these young people are like, kind of like, okay, I don't get it, you know what I mean? I have to tell them, go to home, ask their parents and then come bring it back so you understand how much you have to make in order to survive. I think one of the same things can happen when it comes to um, early parenthood. I mean, when you have um, individuals and institutions that need people to come and help them out, especially with early childhood care, um, if we can set up something to where these students can go and find out what it's like to have a baby 24-7. You know, I mean, or a certain amount of time. Don't just go to your auntie's house and pick them up for two hours and then you leave out. You know, if we have kind of things that actually pinpoint what it's really like to be a parent and how, you know, no, you can't go out on Saturday nights all the time. You're not gonna be able to do certain things as a young person. Um, when it comes to school, being a parent and being in school is very hard. And so if you want to do further education, it's easier if you have that time that you don't have if you have a child. So kind of emphasizing some of the things in terms of their goals and what they want to do and what they will have to sacrifice for their goals if they end up becoming pregnant or becoming a father at an early age. Also, let, I mean, and I don't know if we can talk about that in school, but I mean, I don't think anybody, I always ask this question, what is the reason for sex? And a lot of my guys say, you know what I'm saying, it's to have fun, you know what I'm saying, to get off type of things, you know? And I'm like, no, it's for reproduction, it's to have a baby. And they kind of think about like, oh, yeah, that is the reason. We're not having these conversations because we're kind of scared to approach them with that type of thing. Don't be afraid of the graphic nature that some of these young people might have when it comes to sex, you know what I'm saying? Engage them in the challenging them. Find out how much it costs for uh, a baby to have diapers throughout the year and let them know that right there and there, you know? And they're like, look, this is what you're looking at and this is just diapers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're not talking about food, we're not talking about healthcare. So making it very plain and simple, like treating these 13 and 14 year olds like you're talking to a 30 year old who's about to have a baby. You know what I mean? We don't do that. We kind of sugarcoat it and they know we're sugarcoating it. And so they're just gonna go ahead and have fun and do those type of things, you know? So that could be some things that have, that's what I do. I try to make it very plain and simple, like it's money. You know, you're gonna have to have this type of money at this type of time if you wanna have a child. And you're talking about you wanna have fun. You're talking about you wanna do this and that. You're not gonna be able to do it as easily. You know, and all you have to do is take some simple steps in order to prevent certain things from happening. Do you have to dig deeper into the reasoning behind you? I had a seventh grader when I worked with middle schoolers who wanted a baby because to her that was unconditional love, and it developmentally appropriate makes sense. No one in her life loved her. A baby was going to need her and love her, so she wanted to be pregnant so that someone would love her. And if we dig deeper to these reasonings and the, the community that's not happening behind these children, because it did take more than my parents to raise me, my four years, leaders, my community, my teachers, it, it takes more than just the parents to love them, care about them, show them they care about them. Otherwise, they seek other ways of getting care. Thank you. We have, thank you, Sobeko. We have time for one more. We have time for one more. I think this gentleman is approaching. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. My name is Hal Ames. I'm with the Ravenwood area, Riverwood Neighborhood Association. And I'd like to make a comment about what he was talking about, what you mentioned about education. 
My job takes me into countries all over the world. I teach English as a second language over the internet. I do that full time. So I'm talking to people in Asia and Europe, and their model is a little different than ours. At about 13 years of age, they take a test to find out what they're good at. And then they are focused into schools, specific schools, that either are uh, math, science, language arts, and humanities. So they find their interests. It's not so generic. So that may be a model that we need to be considering here in the United States. What I'd like to talk about is we have a number of beautiful parks in this city. In my neighborhood, we have Riverwood Park. And I go there and I see these beautiful fields. I see a basketball court. I see uh, a rugby field. I see a soccer field. And I see no one there. We rely upon communities, and I was with the Indiana Youth Soccer Association as a board member for many years. I was a referee, I was a coach, I had my own soccer club, I was president of the league. It took us bringing the kids to the parks to provide an opportunity for them to have some kind of involvement. If it wasn't for these associations, these parks would be empty. What can the city council do with these beautiful indie parks to provide programs for children that have organization, not necessarily sports, but we can have craft activities, we can have educational activities at these beautiful facilities that a lot of times are just empty unless we've got somebody who's bringing the children there. That's my question to you. And so they were going to respond with a, with a clarifying question back to you. Okay, well. <laughs> Those are the ground rules. <laughs> Uh, that's a small one, and uh, a Baca's one as well. Uh, I know that I was surprised at some of the programming at some of the parks in my own district. Uh, I got a flyer once to send out to my district, and I said, hey, could you, you know, send us out? Let everybody know, and I opened it up first, and I'm like, oh my goodness, all of this is going on in my park. Is, is it possible that there's more going on than we realize, but we all, but I'll take responsibility in my own district, are not letting people know, or do you think there is, well, there's going to be some missing program, but how much of it is not promoting what we have, and how much of it is just going missing? Well, there's certain areas, like Garfield Park has a lot of activities, right. but that's community-based. The people who live there bring those programs to the park. How can, I'm asking the city, can they sponsor some of these programs? But your advertising is a good point. How do we know what's going on at the parks? But uh, twice a year we have a big rugby tournament in our park. And there are people everywhere and cars everywhere. And then the next weekend, there's nothing. Well, thank you. I guess uh, it's a follow-up to that. There are a number of activities that are going on, but you had indicated that there were kids that were participating unless they were brought. Is that, is that what you would say? Uh, if there's something happening, the kids will come. So by a soccer program, say at Psalm Park, Northeast Youth Soccer uses Psalm Park for their program. They bring the kids, they organize everything, they take care of the goals and, and everything. If there was no Northeast Youth Soccer, there would be empty fields. So these are community-based things that are using these parks can they be better utilized by the city promoting projects and fairs and events for the community that these children can become involved with? It's all now, and, and the neighborhoods are willing to do it. There, there are neighborhoods who are doing it. But what can our city, who owns these parks, do to motivate it? For a soccer club to use a park, they have to follow a permit, and they, there's, a, there's a process they have to go through to get permission to use the park. I understand that. That's good. But if they're not there, like my park is empty most of the time. There are kids playing in the water park. There are three or four kids playing basketball. What if there was a mentor there that would say, hey, guys, let me show you a few things? Or if we had maybe a, somebody from Indy 11 come out and say, I'm going to put on a soccer clinic. Come on down. You know, little doesn't take much. The kids will come if the program's there. How do we get more programs? And I think it goes back to wherever you went. Getting the kids involved. Finding their skills. 
Thank you. Are there any closing questions from the conversation today from our panelists? Nope, our comments. I'm sorry. the end of this comment about open spaces. Uh, we're a firm believer in open spaces and safe places for our young people in our community, but we have to create the value we want to see. And I think the missing element usually are the people who really could create the element, young people and having a conversation about what they really want to see, uh, whether it's school, uh, when they go to school, what they expect to see in terms of curriculum, and how we mirror school back to community. Aftercare, after school, between four and seven is a challenge. The other part of the thing is understanding the issue when it comes down to, again, open space and how we, once upon a time, without the round room, many of us understood what it was to go to a center or a place and spend time there. The question is, do our children use that today? Uh, they're more electronic setting, and what does the term mean to go out and play? Well, fine, thank you, too. But please say, go pick up your. Uh, smartphone and have at it. So I guess you have to have a real conversation about, about uh, expectations and understanding that. And lastly, I think the other part of it is looking at the, uh, the pre-school issue. I, I think it's important that we, we the law enforcement, recognize and see it when we were responding to homes, how children are advancing and sometimes they're more sophisticated than parents. Yeah. And by the time they're seven years old, many of them are more sophisticated in some ways. In the way they operate. So we have to be willing to sit down with you and hope this outcome continues, allowing us to continue to hear from you. But we'd like to give you some feedback back at some point, maybe have more. We'll, uh, I mean, come away with some takeaways we can work on as, as, a, as a team. Thank you. Thank you. So we've reached the end of our time together. I want you again to give yourselves a round of applause for participating in our first neighborhood forum.